Boar's Head invites you to enlighten your senses. Introducing Boar's Head Ichiban Teriyaki-style chicken. Inspired by Japanese master chefs, our signature teriyaki glaze is crafted with garlic, ginger, and a hint of brown sugar. Then paired with our tender, slow-roasted chicken breast for a flavor that's sweet, savory, remarkably bold. Boar's Head Ichiban Teriyaki-style chicken. The bold flavor of Japan. Now available at your local Publix Deli. Log Talk Radio. Are you looking for an all-natural solution to skin care? Try Simply Sita all-natural skin care products. Coconut oil locks in moisture with nature's finest organic solution. Rich with vitamin E and rejuvenating proteins, it can help with enhancing skin nourishment for wrinkles, skin damage, tissue repair, and more. Simply Sita skin care line includes Simply Sita coconut oil, Simply Sita bath salts, and Simply Sita bath gel. Get healthier looking skin today. Order all three today for $40 at www.simplyceta.com. And I know for a fact that it helps with diabetic edema. My husband has edema on both of his legs. He is insulin dependent, and he also has very dry skin on his feet and toes, and it has made a world of difference. You definitely want to go to www.simplyceta.com and order her products today. They do not have any unnatural ingredients or any preservatives. It is all simply coconut oil with maybe a little jasmine. Order it today. Are you looking for a website creator that will make your website stand out above the herd? Are you looking for someone that knows your needs and can create a website that is not only eye-catching, but one that will stay with the customer as they scroll through the net? If so, contact Wellhaven and Associates. Lourdes Wellhaven has the magic touch when it comes to websites. You give her an idea and let her run with it, and she will create something beautiful. If you don't believe me, check out author Yvonne Mason at dot com and see what she has done for me. And here's the great thing. If you contact her and give her my name, she'll give you $100 off. So don't wait. Don't delay. Call today or go online and look up Wilhaven and Associates and send her an email and tell her what you need. She will get back with you promptly. The year, 1888. The place, London's East End. Dead and mutilated bodies are popping up all over from Stamford to Whitechapel. Jack the Ripper is leaving his mark and the city's on edge. Yvonne Mason is back with a tale of murder and millinery. The Rhodes Hat Factory is booming while the body count rises. Why now? How are these hats connected? Has the hatter gone mad? Mad Hatter, Yvonne Mason. Available now on Amazon.com. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is Off the Chain, and I am your host, Yvonne Mason. And yes, we have all gone mad. Mad, I say, mad. But then all the best people are. Tonight's guest is an interesting person. I've known him for quite a few years now. And I have to say that when I look at his artwork, it is frightening. Sometimes it can be the things that nightmares are made of. He is Providence native, Dave Lipscomb, and he showed signs of an artistic talent, believe it or not, ladies and gentlemen, around the age of one. And despite his having been raised in a creatively stifling pocket of New England and upstate New York, this never discouraged his true calling as a visual artist. Actually, his art gradually evolved from innocent cartoons into something much darker as his disgust for his surroundings and their corresponding social social conventions grew. I don't know what's wrong. I can't talk tonight. Dave's publishing credits include the original edition of Last Burn in Hell, the anthology No One Makes It Out Alive, I, Lucifer, My Soul Stained, My Seed Sour, Belly and Woman, and the first four years of the erotic horror anthology Infernal Ink Magazine, Devilishly Erotic Horror. 
Good evening, Dave. How are you? Hey, how's it going, everyone? I am, nice to finally I talk to you. I am fine. Thank you so, so much for coming on this show tonight because I've been wanting to interview you for a long, long time. Oh, really? Nice. Yes. Very good. Well, your, your artistic ability just, it's something that, it interests me because it is different. But before yeah, we get into that, and before we get into that, tell the folks a little bit about our history together because we've known each other for a minute or two. Well, I mean, see, you and I met on Facebook through Hydra and Star, and this was at least ten years ago, right? At least. That's what I'm thinking. And, uh, and you know, it's 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 been really funny. I mean, I've been watching you, uh, you know, build your empire with your all the books that you publish and all the various projects you get involved in. It's pretty amazing. Well, thank you, but you're you're not too slouchy yourself because oh, I have I, I have seen your artwork evolve, which takes us back to one year old. You started drawing. According to my mother, yeah. But um, I do remember drawing around the age of three. That was my earliest memory of me my, when I started drawing. And the and reason I did that, what was that? It wasn't stick figures either, was it? Well, I was trying not to make it stick figures. <laughs> I mean, uh, I started out drawing like, uh, you know, here's the thing, like, the reason why I would obsessively draw is that I, you know, I was a big cartoon fanatic. And every Saturday morning at 12 when the cartoons ended and ABC's Wide World of Sports came on, it was just like a oh, bummer. My dad would take over the living room, so I would just go into my bedroom, sit down at my chalkboard, and start drawing because I wanted to see cartoons all day long. And wow. If I couldn't have them on TV, I would make them. So that's where it all started really. When did you so move talking. from when did you move from children's cartoons to the artwork that you do now? How did that transition? Well, uh let's see, it was like a gradual uh progression from the cartoony stuff and then when I got into monster movies that took over. So there were endless pictures of Godzilla and King Kong and, you know, the like. Mostly those two. I mean, I can remember I spent an entire year trying to perfect the poster for the 1976 version of King Kong because I would just draw it obsessively. I thought that was the coolest poster ever. So to me, that was practice. And Did I, you I just threw it, it over. No, of course not. <laughs> <laughs> I don't believe perfection can be reached, but if you could try for excellence, that's good. Well, were you ever satisfied with with it? I'll put it that way. I was never, ever, ever satisfied. That's why I kept drawing it endlessly over and over and over. And then Star Wars happened, and that, wow, man, that kicked me up a whole other level, and that's all I drew was Star Wars for about a year or two. And then uh, when I started, I came across a magazine called Fangoria, which was, you know, before there was Famous Monsters, and that was a black and white magazine devoted to uh, monster movies. And it featured mostly old stuff, but current stuff, too. And that could be creepy, but Fangoria was a whole other thing because it was bloody and gory and shocking as hell. <laughs> and that really put the hook in me, and I was just like, holy shit, this is hardcore. And so that kind of influenced my artwork by the time I was reaching my teens. And as a teenager, I was extremely frustrated with everything. And I had no way to express my anger, so it all went to the artwork. So my artwork got a lot more violent and, you know, more horror subjects, you know, arrows, piercing eyeballs, that kind of thing, you know. Everything you could, almost, you could have almost been profiled as one of my serial killers. Well, you know. I was a good kid, but I kept it all bottled up, and I, that was the only place I was able to unleash it, right in there. And, you know, but people that, that – that, oh, that, it, that within itself, though, Dave, is you understood that 
that's exactly what it was. You didn't have any desires to go out and and make that drawing real. It was a way for you to release right. whatever you were angry about or upset about and put it on paper. Yeah, yeah, because you know, uh, Juvie Hall did not sound like a good idea to me. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's mean? not a very, it's not a nice yeah. place. Not no, a nice place. I heard. <laughs> well, when so, you, you know, transitioned, when you transitioned from cartoons and monsters to the more gory and the more horror, did you shock those around you, or did people even see it? Well, um, some people at school were, you know, they were either amused by it or disturbed by it. And I, my mother did not like it at all, as you can imagine. So I tried not to show her too much of it. I kept it to myself. But I tried not to push it in her face, you know what I mean? Because I didn't want her right. to send me to Jesus Emperor, you know, an exorcist or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> so I kept doing that, and, you know, that was working for me. I mean, if anything, it was therapeutic just about. And then, you know, when, I'm going to turn to... Uh, go ahead. No, you go ahead. Yours is more important. I think I lost my train of thought. <laughs> <laughs> you returned to something. Oh, it wasn't a return to. I mean, the sexual stuff came much, much later on because before I'd always been a little self-conscious of doing that kind of stuff, but then uh, later on as I just kind of uh, grew up a really fucking attitude. I said, you know what, I'm going to put some tits and ass in there. I don't give a goddamn. Now, ladies and gentlemen, well, what Dave is talking about is he he combined horror with sex. Erotic, erotic horror is, I guess, the terminology that we're using for it these days. Right. But, you know, the sex was still a little downplayed compared to all the horror that I was depicting. So that was my main power source right there. It's just really weird. Um, I'm very much influenced by uh, psychedelic art, too. So that played a big part in my creations. You know, like what? those little Fillmore posters. <laughs> yes, yes. Speaking of, of Fillmore pictures, what or who in the industry influenced you and why? I know one of the people that we talked about before the show was Vincent Price. Now, right. he, was a, he was a magnificent horror actor. He did Poe great. How did he influence I mean, you? Well, man, um, the way he influenced me was when I depict horrible subjects, I try to make them beautiful at the same time. Like, I don't like, you know, lots of, like, interesting colors or swirly patterns because that was pretty much his, uh, the vibe that I got from him. He was the, the gentleman beast. He was very refined, but his characters did very horrible things. You know, he, he would murder somebody while wearing a smoking jacket or whatever. You know what I mean? What the, and yeah. I wanted to bring that same kind of vibe to my work in my own low rent way, you know what I mean? And that so makes perfect sense because, because you're right. Vincent Price was a dynamic. The first picture that I remember seeing him in was The House of Usher. Right. Oh, great one. And it was black and white. It was the yeah. first horror movie I ever saw, and I had nightmares for weeks. But you couldn't get enough not so much of the female character, but of him right. in his his dark gentleman way. He was he was a kind villain, so to speak. Yes, he was. He was even sympathetic in some of his movies. In fact, a lot of his movies, I thought he was very sympathetic, especially his Doctor Fives movies, which yes. were outrageous, and those have influenced the hell out of me. And and those were so what you did is you took some of, of his dynamic as as a gentleman villain, a, a sinister gentleman villain, and right. incorporated them into your artwork. Is that a correct yes. statement? Yeah, I, I, I just wanted to get that, that feeling, you know, not to pick him specifically, but to, to have that sort of aura come out from the artwork. 
like what you were looking at was bizarre or horrible, but there was a kind of a beauty to it. You know, that you couldn't take of, your eyes off of because you can't take your eyes off of Vincent Price when he's on the screen. You cannot do it. He well, he's a dashing figure. He's suave and he's got that that voice, that velvet voice of his. I mean, the guy the guy was an alpha. <laughs> <laughs> In a dark and sinister way. And you also yeah. said H.P. Lovecraft, which I find interesting because H.P. Lovecraft was, his books are, they're dark and sinister, but they're subtle. Right. Yeah, they're not overly gory or anything like that. But he had a way of writing which really got under your skin, and you carried it with you long after that. And plus, I liked his suggestions. Uh, he wasn't always explicit about his creatures, but when he was, it was just like, wow, that would be something really cool to draw or something like that. So, so you, know, you all actually of his could see, powers. You, you could, in your mind as an artist, you saw these creatures evolve as he began to describe them in his stories. Right. Yeah, and I, you know, whenever I wanted to depict a, a creature on the a sort of like right out of a nightmare, I would have him in mind. And so, you know, there's a lot of tentacles in my work, and that came from his uh, Zulu character and other things like that. That is interesting. That, and I understand that strangely enough, because as a writer, I I understand exactly what your thought process was. Right, and that's just a fraction of it. <laughs> now, well, let's go and switch gears for just a minute because okay. George Carlin, of all people, a comedian. Ah, uh, yes. How did he, how was he an influence? Well, it's sort of a similar, much in a similar way that, believe it or not, Vincent Price is an influence. I mean the way that he was a total wordsmith. He loved language. He loved wordplay. And he would combine that with his increasing anger and disgust at society. So he could tell you something that was really shocking and offensive, but the way he worded it was very almost uh, whimsical, I guess you could say. So again, so you you're... Trans- you're so you translated that over into your artwork and I, I am, yeah. I'm, and that it was whimsical while being horror, while being shocking, while being subtle, while being classic. Right, because you're you're looking at something offensive, but at the same time, it's kind of silly. <laughs> <laughs> so that's how he's influenced my artwork. Well, tell me how Miles died. I mean, these are interesting people. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm looking at these names that that influence Dave, and because I have seen his artwork, it it just, to, I can't put into words how amazing these influences have been on him. Miles Davis, of all uh, people. Yeah. <laughs> Explain well. that one. Yeah, I think that deserves an explanation. Um, when I draw, I like to listen to music. And because that, I, I find it really odd to draw in silence. I mean, I can do it, but I don't like to do it. So I usually have some sort of music on, and usually I try to pick music that's going to fit what kind of vibe I want to bring to the piece. So if I'm doing something that I know is going to be very complex and complicated, then I'm going to listen to uh, complex music, mainly like progressive rock or jazz fusion. And Miles' music, uh, specifically of the late 60s through the mid-70s, it was very dark and primal and complex, and that is perfect for a lot of the things that I depict. Wow. I hope that clears up. Lon, Lon Chaney, my one of my favorite, favorite all-time horror actors, the man. The king. The king. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think his influence is pretty obvious. Well, in a way, I mean, okay, he was the man of a thousand faces. 
when I'm doing a piece, I actually put myself into the piece. I'm actually acting the part mentally. So even no matter what kind of character it is, I'm, while I'm putting it together, I'm pretending to be this character. Because to me, that's the only way to really give it some sort of life. That, and that's what he, that's like being that's like putting yourself into to a book that you're writing. Yeah, yeah, you the become same part, Yeah, you become part of that piece. So you actually leave a piece of yourself in that artwork when you're finished with it. Right, exactly. So I mean that's that's who I look to for that kind of inspiration too when I'm when I'm becoming these characters. Andy no Kaufman. What they were. Tell oh, me how Andy. Andy... <laughs> and now he oh. is a unique. He was a unique individual. Right. He's the closest. So how did he influence the... you? Oh, made his mischievous nature. I mean. A lot of my stuff has a very mischievous spirit to it, and I owe that a lot to him. Because growing up watching his bizarre performances on TV and just, it would just have me like rolling off my chair, holding my stomach. And, and then later on, reading about all the stunts that he did, all of the elaborate pranks that he pulled. I mean, it's maybe his influence isn't as overt or even as much as, say, Carl or Vincent Price, but I. I think of him a lot when I'm doing certain pieces, like, you know, oh, this is really going to fuck with people. <laughs> I think of Andy Kaufman. <laughs> Explain to well, some of the audience, some of the audience might not remember Andy Kaufman or remember the 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 show that he was famous for. Explain to well, the audience. Well, he was, uh, he played uh, the, the, the foreign character, Lavka Gravis, on the, the sitcom Taxi. And he was a, you know, he was a character from a, an imaginary country, he was a mechanic, and he spoke in a language that Kaufman himself made up. And that was, anyone who didn't know anything else about him other than that, they were only seeing about 1% of his talent. Because the guy was a first-rate prankster. Yes, he was. Yeah. And, and, and some of your, up, go ahead. Oh, he came up with a character named Tony Clifton, who was a lounge singer. And he would portray this character, but even after Kaufman died, uh, Tony Clifton still makes appearances. <laughs> <laughs> even as a Facebook page. <laughs> we we lost him way too soon. Henry yeah, Rollins. Did. Now, I find that one very, very interesting. Why Henry Rollins? Uh, his intensity. And his, uh, you know, his, the fact that he's unafraid to confront certain subjects. Just like I'm, I don't care about confronting certain sexual subjects in my work. And you do it with force. But at the same time, you know, you get that Vincent Price in there, you know, you make it, you don't make it brutal and ugly, you know, you make it look attractive if you can. So just and his then, attitude and his fierceness, you know what I mean? Yes. The the last one, I mean, there's there's more we could talk about, what, but the one that really, really interests me is, yeah. I think you know where I'm going, Anton okay. LaVey. Uh, Anton LaVey. Yes. Um, I looked him up. I was not sure who he was, so I looked him up, and I found him very, very interesting not yes. only is he the founder of the Church of Satan, but tell the audience what else he does. Well, um, before he founded the Church of Satan, uh, he had a very checkered past. He ran away from, he literally ran away from home and joined the circus. Uh, he learned to become a, uh, a lion trainer, and he learned hypnosis and magic tricks. He even played the calliope, which is a circus organ. And he carried that with him to other professions, like he would play in churches, he would play in burlesque houses. Um, at one point, he was a police photographer for the San Francisco Police Department. And he, you know, he would photograph all of the accidents and the murders and all that kind of thing. And, uh, you know, he was an uh, autodidact. He had 
he loved books, and he, uh, he was a genius at unearthing stuff that was forgotten, whether it was uh, old music or old books or old figures that history almost forgot. So he, the dude was a renaissance man. I mean, <laughs> incredible, you know what I mean? And I think, you know, Hydra went into him a little bit uh, last night on her interview, too. Yes, she did, but I did not realize that he was a musician and an author until I did my research on him. Right. And now... Yeah. And an artist, too. He was was a visual artist. He was a painter, and, uh, you know, he put together mannequins. I mean, he just did all kinds of things. He's, he was also into the occult as well, but yes. was that before he founded the Church of Satan or after? Well, um, right before he founded the Church of Satan, um, he had already been studying the occult. He had been studying what, the occult on the sidelines all his life because his grandmother, who was from Europe, used to tell him stories about vampires and monsters and things like that, and I believe she read him Dracula. And, you know, that strongly influenced him. And um, in the 60s, he had a group of cohorts that he named the Magic Circle because every, I think it was every Friday night, they would get together at his house. And it started off as, you know, a little soiree at first, but then they turned into lectures. And he would find a different topic every week. And it was always interactive. And then... From that core of people, that gradually evolved into the Church of Satan. How does how does he influence you in your amazing artwork? Well, um, he, I'll tell you right off the bat right now, I'm a Satanist. I'm also a member of the Church of Satan. I thought you like, were. Yeah. Um, as far as artwork goes, you know, it's hard to pinpoint. Um I think more on the, the lustful, sexual side of my stuff. I always have his attitude in mind as well. I mean, I'm not sure if the guy would ever like my... I, I'm not sure if he would like my work if he saw it. Maybe he would, maybe he wouldn't. But we'll never know because he's no longer alive. But uh, some of his old paintings were pretty gruesome too. and they were, But they were very... I guess you could say Adams, Charles Adams, you know, Adams family style, where I tend to go a little bit more uh, out there. His was a little bit. He was a little bit more restrained, a little bit more restrained in his work. Where I, you know, I've got this crazy, I've got this crazy psychedelic shit going on. And, you know, I don't think he was into that sort of style, so I don't know whether or not he would have liked my work, but, you know. And that would, ac- is- that w- the, the psychedelic style would account for the Jimi Hendrix influence. Yes, absolutely. And he's, <laughs> sometimes when I want a really crazy vibe, I will put on his music, and that will influence what I draw, or how I draw it, really, because I already have the subject matter in mind. But if I want to depict it a certain way, I'll choose his music. Now, something else I found interesting. Douglas right. Kenny. Douglas Kenny, yes. <laughs> oh, I mean, I, he's the co-founder of National Lampoon Magazine, of all things. Yeah. Yes. Well, I and, kind of... Inquiring uh, minds want to know, Dave. Inquiring minds got to know. Douglas well, Kenny. Well, you know, it, it's his irreverency, like Carlin, that also influenced the irreverency in my stuff. And plus, you know, I first found out about the guy when I was a freshman in college. And, you know, sometimes when you go off to college, you move to a big city, and for some reason you just start writing. I don't know why that happens. I mean, that's a common experience. And I wrote a lot of really rude and silly pieces inspired by him. And eventually that sort of flavor made its way into my art, too. And I've got all kinds of stuff in my art. I mean, it's like a gumbo. All right, that brings me to my next question. Right. Do you sell your artwork? I do. I do. As a matter of fact, um, I do commission book covers. And I also have uh, two sites where I sell prints of my work. 
And one of them is on Zazzle.com, and it's called uh, Mark of the Devil. And the other one is on, oh, what's the name of that one? I haven't been to that one in a long time. <laughs> Here we go. Oh, Art Pal. And that one's called House of the Devil. And that's strictly prints, but on the Zazzle shop, you can get T-shirts, coffee mugs, you know, uh, some prints, cell phone covers, et cetera. I'm still building those up. I have a lot on there already, but there's still much more to do on that. Is are all of your is all of your artwork that you sell is it all erotica horror or is it broken up or is it just a plethora of different artwork? I mean, I have them separated by. Uh, you know, I have one section where it's all the covers I did for for a leg magazine. And then um, I have one section dedicated to my Krampus illustrations that I did for uh, Herotica, which ended up in the book uh, Belly Ali and Woman. And then I have, uh, you know, odds and ends. But not all of them are erotic, you know. Now, for the people that don't know who Krampus is, explain right. to them who who Krampus is. Well, Krampus is a mythical demon uh, from the uh, the Alps countries, like uh, Germany, Switzerland, etc. And he is a Christmas demon. And every the night of December 5th is known as uh, Krampusnacht, also known as Krampus Night. And that's when Krampus goes out and looks for all the bad children. You know how Santa Claus takes care of the good children? Uh-huh. Uh, he, he looks for the bad children. And he whips them, he beats them, drags them off to hell, <laughs> maybe cuts their heads off. A really fun character. And you can always hear him approaching by the large bells that he wears on his belt. So it's like that dread sound. And, it, you know, he's been terrifying kids for, you know, Decades, but, you know, they wouldn't bring that kind of thing over here. I mean, they had that movie last year. I don't know if it was any good because I didn't watch it because I figured it was going to be watered down as hell. It probably I'm told was. it's all right. Yeah. I'm told it was all right. But that's basically Krampus in a nutshell. I mean, other cultures have their own version of him. Like, I think in some country, uh, some cultures he's known as Black Peter. And he's more that's human-like true. than demon. But he does the same thing. He, You know, he goes after the bad kids. I did not know there was a Black Peter. I just thought it was Krampus. That's interesting. Yeah. Nope. yeah. Well, tell no, tell the cool. audience some of the books that you've illustrated for and explain to them how you go about illustrating those covers um, when someone, for instance, our friend Rick Powell, Yes. You did a book well, for him. Yeah, I did uh, My Soul Stained, My Seed Sour. That was his first book, and it was a collection of poetry that he had written. And um, the way it worked out was I asked him what he wanted me to depict. And he has a companion. It's a mannequin um, that's in his bedroom, very eerie-looking. You know, blank eyes, long hair, long white gown, very spectral. He wanted me to depict her, and he also wanted me to depict um, the woods where he spent a lot of time as a child. So I was like, okay, so he says, you can do anything you want as long as those two elements are in there. I'm like, all right, so dark woods and the mannequin. So as I was sketching it out, you know, I'm like, well, I don't want to just throw her face as it is. I got to make it more eye-catching, so I decided to have her plastic face half-cracked and have a skull exposed underneath with a worm crawling out and the wind blowing her hair with leaves and everything like that, and that's how that came about. And I showed him a concept sketch, and he went wild over it, and I I said, proceed. He's like, yeah, proceed. (laughs) That's what happened. (laughs) And and ladies and gentlemen, if, if you haven't seen Rick's book, my soul stained, my seed soured. That cover is very, 
eye-catching. And as an author, and I've, I've read books since I was old enough to pick one up, right. if the cover doesn't attract my attention, you can pretty much figure that Yvonne's not going to pick that book up because it takes time, which I don't have. So when yeah. when Dave, and you, you agree with me, right, Dave, that cover's got to pop. Yeah, it has to pop. I mean, if you don't have a compelling cover, what's the point? How is it going to jump out at you from the stands? And do you agree that that cover should tell the story in a in a moment or enough of the story in a moment that you'll want to turn that next page? I think as long as it has something to do with the story or the feeling related to the story, you know, the emotions, you know, if you depict that successfully somehow, then you're good. And if you do it in And I have way. picked up books where the, the cover shows something that has absolutely nothing to do with the story itself, and you're wondering, how did this right. relate? Yeah. Well, it used to frustrate me when I'd buy a certain comic book as a kid and the cover had nothing to do with what was going on on the inside. I was just like, oh, come on, man. Like, yeah, I like yeah, that creature. Almost, Stand on it. It was, a, it was a farce. It was almost like they deceived you into buying the product. Yeah, exactly. And that, yeah, it was, a, it was such a huckster thing, which, you know, can be good, but, you know, you don't want to feel ripped off either. You can admire right. that you, tactic. You don't especially want to as, All right, let me ask you this. If if someone approaches you and says, I have this book, and it has ABC, the storyline. Right. But it but it's not horror, or it's not erotica, or it's not in what you I would call in your wheelhouse. Yeah. Would you be able, because you do that that particular wheelhouse, would you be able to take that person's story and make a cover to fit the story? So even if it was a non-horror book or a non, you know, weird book, right? You're saying, let's say for for the sake of this discussion, let's say somebody approached you and said, "I've got this romance story: boy meets girl, boy loses girl, boy finds girl, happily ever after." I want a popping cover, not the normal boy girl on the cover. Right. Would you be comfortable doing that? Um, even though it's not my usual forte, I could do it. I would be up for the challenge because. Sometimes design itself is what will sell the piece. It's, you know, not so much uh, the subject matter depicted on the cover. If you arrange it in a unique way, eye-catching way, then you've got something there. That's good to know. So, so ladies and gentlemen, understand, if you're looking for a cover artist, don't let Dave's wheelhouse scare you off because He's just saying as things. an artist, he can do other <laughs> things. He's open for which would which might be good to expand your own horizons. Exactly. Yeah, you know, we're always yeah. evolving. We're always growing. Yeah, I mean, you, you should always be growing. I mean, you should always be willing to try new things, even if you just do it, you know, inch by inch. As long as you're trying something new out, and it doesn't have to well, be an abrupt. You know, three six or you know, one eighty. But you know, it, I think it it's, be, it's good to experiment. An evolution over time. Who knows? You might get in a whole new, a whole new project of of doing book designs that you never thought about doing. Right. Exactly. You know, it could go anywhere. All but the that possibilities comes are there. To, that comes with being able to replicate all kinds of uh, scenes no matter what the genre is, you know, because as long as I have my research tools, I'm good, you know. You want me to depict a cover about the Revolutionary War? I could do it. You know what and I mean? And see, so, now, but, if, if, someone, if someone were looking at your page and looking at some of your artwork and they were looking for a cover designer, they may or may not be hesitant to contact you because – they're not open-minded enough to say, I wonder if he would. They just naturally might assume, right. oh, well, this guy's not for me because this is what he does. And 
we we box ourselves in right. when we do that. Yeah, very true. Because right now I'm playing to my strengths, but little by little I'm going to add other elements into it as well. Because it is important to grow and expand. It is. Because then you become more well-rounded and, and you have more opportunities to do more things and get known for more than just your erotica horror art, which is absolutely beautiful. Even in all well, of it, it's like you say, it's a Vincent Price type of horror because it's it's smooth, it's cla- it's it's repulsive without being repulsive, if that makes any sense. Yeah, well, that's that's the aim. I don't want to gross anybody out. I want to draw them in, even if the subject matter is completely just off-putting and, you know, disturbing and will linger in your mind for weeks. I just want to... It does that. It it lingers. Trust me. Good. You tell me, you tell me before the show that you have some new projects going on. Um, are these authors that you're designing book covers for? Yes. Uh, one in particular, uh, there's a cover I'm working on right now that I'm aiming to have ready by the end of the month. Um, it's for a relatively new author named uh, R.J. Murray, and he's also a visual artist, by the way. But he wanted, he sought me out to design um, an illustration for his book that he's going to have on Kindle. It's going to be called uh, Lufa Mar and the Other World. And it's a it's a really neat fantasy horror sex gore story that's it's sort of in the tradition of uh, the talisman. And right now I'm uh, designing the cover for that, and should have that over to him soon. And then also uh, off into the distant future, you're familiar with uh, Jennifer Miller, right? She I've heard the name. Uh, yes. She does the uh, yearly anthology, The Ladies and Gentlemen of Horror. And that's a benefit anthology. And she contacted me and told me that she was going to be working on a couple of novels that were going to be tied together. So she's tapped me to do two book covers. So I'll be working on those as well. But that's a little bit later on down the line because I'm not sure that she's done writing the books yet. Are they? They're also horror novels, right? Yeah, it sounds like from what she described, from the ideas that she threw at me about what to depict on the cover, it's definitely in the realm of uh, horror fantasy. I'm not sure that it's going to be like horror erotica, but definitely horror fantasy, I think, from what she described. Well, do you... But again... Do you still put pen to paper to write, or are you just now only doing artwork? Well, um, I used to write a music column when I was uh, working with Hydra on Infernal Inc. And for that, I, you know, I would just write straight onto the computer, you know, Word or whatever. But um, every once in a while, I'll get out a pen and a notebook and I'll jot some things down, but it's, it's very disjointed at this point. You know, I might start writing more again like that, but we'll see what happens. I think you should. I think yeah, you would make you know, a, you'd make a great I've horror told, writer. I've been told that I write pretty well, so you know, throughout the years, so you know, I might pick that up again. I don't think it's a good idea to let it totally go to waste if there's a little no, spark there. Because I'm sure, in in your mind, and in the like, with all of us artistic people, and ladies and gentlemen, trust me when I say. All of us as artists, whether we're musicians or whether we're artists or whether we're writers, we do have these insane voices in our head, and they will not shut up. Is that right, right Dave? Oh, yeah. Oh, if you could see inside my head, uh, well, I think there'd be like a thousand scaly fists punching their way out. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of shouting and obscenities. It's very crazy. And what... And, and what do you do to shut them up? You can't shut them up. You can only work with them. Maybe you could try and conduct them <laughs> into playing like, you know, have them play you a song or something. <laughs> but you can never shut them up. 
that's why it's so hard for me to get to sleep because my brain will not shut off. So and I have you're to probably, check my brain. You're probably slightly OCD as well. I'm sure I'm all those fancy initials that they use to describe human emotions. I'm sure I've got all of that. I've just never been diagnosed and I've never taken pills for it, you know what I mean? But I'm sure I'm every single one of those. I'm sure I'm ADD, I'm sure I'm ADHD, whatever, I don't know. They come up with new ones every five minutes. Well, all of us artistic types have some sort of... Um... Oh, we're, we're not normal. We're, that's, we're not normal. Never, and never forget that you're not normal. Never forget that oh. you think on a whole oh. different level than the average person. You don't see the world in the same way. I was I, mean, I was normal once. I was normal once for a day, and I didn't like it. <laughs> I mean, that's why it hurts to try and be normal. I mean, it, it's just uh, every time I've tried to do something normal, or it, it just came out really funny and bizarre, and it just yeah, never doing that again. What? How did you wind up in California? Well, um, before California, I lived in Connecticut for 12 years. And that's where I spent my teen years and the first part of my 20s. And uh, those 12 years felt like 24. And um, my immediate family, uh, my mother and my two brothers, we all decided that we were sick of Connecticut and we wanted a new life. We wanted to get the hell out. So we came up with a plan to work really hard for a year. You know, I was working like, I was working two jobs. I was working seven days a week plus doing art commissions on the side. It was a very exhausting year. I don't know how I did it. Well, I was young, that's why. But um, we saved up our money and we drove out to California without any um, connections. We found a motel, started looking for jobs, got an apartment, then eventually went our separate ways. So we did it the old-fashioned way. Do you like California? Yeah, I mean, California's got its own problems, but I this is still the best thing I ever did coming out. I mean, for one thing, you can't find, the weather. True. But do, do you find that California... Um, we're getting some feedback from your computer. Uh-huh. Do you find that California helps your creative juices better than anywhere else? You know, that's that's an interesting question. Um, ah, I never really thought about that because it's funny because I consider my style to be more East Coast, in other words, crowded and noisy. You know, traditionally, and I'm, you know, I'm using big brush strokes here, pardon the pun, but, you know, (laughs) California has been known to be, you know, got lots of space, everything is wide open, very airy, and the stuff that I do is the opposite. It's very cramped and crowded and claustrophobic, and it's, you know, bursting to break out of the page. So... I don't know. So I, I think it's like the opposite. That's a really good question. I really don't know how to answer that question. I'll have to ponder that some more. Well, the reason I what? ask is because a lot of of the artistic people come out of California. Writers, well, I'll tell producers. I'll tell you something. When I moved out here and I started reading about all the low brow artists who lived out here, I got really excited. And that really lit a fire under my ass. You know, people like Robert Williams, that kind of thing. Uh-huh. The guys who were formerly hot rod artists, you know, that kind of, but the, the crazy rap thing characters and all of that. That was a really exciting scene going on. And I think my art sort of, it was very much influenced by that. So, yeah, I got to say that California in that respect helped that way. It's interesting. And the fact that they were and they, the fact that these guys weren't afraid to use, you know, over cartoonish but really, like, savage sexuality into their uh, pieces. And that rubbed off on me, too, and I was just like, oh, this is great, you know. <laughs> you know, maybe well, I could use some of that. 
tell tell the audience again where you can be found because I want to see you get some more commissions, both for your artwork and for cover designs. And and let's get you out there. Let's broaden your horizons. So okay. tell the audience okay. where you can be found. Well, there is. A, I have a Facebook art page. It's www.facebook.com. Davils Gallery, D A V E capital L S Gallery. And I also have a page on deviantart.com. And I go by the Davil on there as well, deviantart.com. And um, also Tumblr, which is um, the davil.tumblr.com. And those are my three outlets so far. I'm going to expand later on. I think I'm going to open up an Instagram later and keep going and see what happens. But that's where I could be reached for now. And you also have your regular Facebook page. Yeah, I have my regular profile. You know, it's under my real name, Dave Lipscomb. So you know, drop if you want to add me, drop me a note first. You know, tell me how you found out about me. Don't just you know <laughs> come out of the blue with a friend request without saying anything because that drives me nuts. I know half the people I I don't approve if I don't know who they are. Yeah. If if I always ask my guests this towards the end of the show because I feel like it is important for people who are who have a dream, whether that dream is to be an artist, right. to go back to school, to be a business person, to be a writer, to be a musician, to be a garbage man, whatever it is that dream is, I always ask my guests to give some of, their words of wisdom to these people that have this dream. So you're on the hot seat to do that now. Oh, boy. Well, you know, it's funny. Most of the time I don't feel like I'm qualified to give out advice because I'm still learning, I'm still growing. You know, I'm not exactly where I want to be yet, but I'm getting there. But I can tell you things that I've observed and conclusions I've come to. I mean, first of all, if you want to you want to be an artist, just do it. Just start doing it. Start drawing. Start painting. Doesn't matter if it looks like shit. You know, you might find. But be honest with yourself. Um, try new things. Try to grow. Um, if you feel like it really isn't your thing, then don't try to force yourself. Do something else. But if you have a really burning desire to do it, just keep going. Look at other artists. In fact, pick like a couple of favorite artists and try to emulate them. And that will teach you a thing or two about how they got to where they are and look up the people who influenced them and then look up those people who influenced those guys and then you'll see where everything came from and you might be able to learn a lot from that. And as far as getting your stuff out there, in the age of the Internet, it's so easy to do now. Just, you know, even if you have to start out with a DeviantArt page, do it, do it, do it, do it. And, and you know, and you never know. Do you do you agree that if someone tries something, they have right. succeeded, whereas if they just give lip service to it, they've already failed? Well, the way I look at it, the moment you pick up a pencil and draw something on a piece of paper, even if it's a piece of shit, technically you have become an artist. There you, you go. know what I mean? I, I uh, hope you're already an artist. Afraid. You might be a shitty artist, but you are an artist at that moment, the minute you're doing that. And then the, the deal from there is to continue. Like you say, you find yeah. the people who influence you, who influence them, and it goes on and on. And don't be afraid trying yeah. new things. Don't and be afraid. Don't to... To... Go ahead. More importantly, don't listen to the people who are always going to put you down for that. You know, the people that are going to tell you, oh, you know, that's just a phase. It's a hobby. You're going to grow out of it, you know. Why are you wasting your time with this stuff? Just don't quit your day job, blah, 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 this and that, you know. So that all you draw is monsters, blah, blah, blah. Don't listen to any of that shit. If you really feel what you're doing, do it to the maximum degree. Give it to them both barrels. Just, just kill it. 
crush it. I'm sorry, Own it. I'm a little over no, yeah, that was it. perfect. Own it, right. because at the end of our days, Dave, do you agree? At the end of our days, when we're laying yes. there, taking those last breaths, and everybody's around us and we're saying, well, you know, I have regrets. I should have done right. that. I could have done this. I would have done this, but it was too late. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and you know, Deciding to become an artist is not like brain surgery. You know what I mean? Nobody's life is at stake. Just like if, if you fancy the idea, try, try it out. Like I said, all you have to do is start with a, a pencil and a piece of paper and, and do it up. Go for it. You know, even if you're afraid of drawing something that sucks, draw something that sucks and keep doing it. You know, draw it over maybe and you want to be... Maybe you want to be known as the suckiest artist of all time, but you'll be known. <laughs> <laughs> and and that, that, is, that is a very true statement, that whatever you do, do the best you can. You know, be damn good at it. If, you're, yeah, if you want to be a failure, be damn good at being a failure, but be damn good at something. If, you want, if you're a guy or a girl that wants to limit themselves by just drawing, you know, pictures of unicorns, be the best goddamn motherfucking uniform, unicorn artist in the world. Just do it, do it, do it, do it. Exactly. Because that's how you, that's unicorn, you are. Put a unicorn boot up everyone's ass. Just let them know what you do. <laughs> All right, I'm getting because, silly now. No, you're not. Because what you're doing is, is you're reiterating what I say at the end of every show. Is right. That really... Our life on this earth is really, really short. Right. And whatever we choose to do in this life is what we will remember at the end of the life. So be be good at something. Be good at, yeah. at anything. Just because don't waste it's fun. It. First of all, yeah. it'll make you feel good about yourself. It's fun, and the more you like it, the more you're going to do. And the more you do, the better you're going to get. And the better you get, the happier you'll be because you're productive. There you go. Exactly. And you will make yourself the god of something. Exactly. And that's a, that's a real thrill right there. Ladies and gentlemen, you are listening to Off the Chain. We are getting to the end of our hour. This is your host, Yvonne Mason. My guest has been Dave Lipscomb, who is a magnificent artist. If you're not friends with him on Facebook, go make friends with him. Tell him you heard from him on the, about him on this show. And look at his artwork. Get him to design a book cover for you. Get him to design a T-shirt for you. A... a um, Cell phone cover, a coffee cup. If you know somebody's got a really twisted sense of, of humor or a really twisted mind, have him design them a coffee cup with one of his twisted, gory, insanely beautiful pieces of artwork because they are insanely gory, beautiful. Tomorrow night, I will be off. I don't have a guest. Surprise, surprise. But on Saturday night, my guest is author Chad Lutz. And he is a very interesting character. All I have on my show are in Dave, I want to thank you. Don't hang up yet, but I, before we run out of time, I okay. want to thank you for the honor of right. having you on my show. I appreciate you. You're a blessing in my life. And to watch you evolve and, and to watch the things that you have accomplished is simply amazing. I'm almost envious because you can draw so beautifully. Oh, thank but, you. I, there's still much to learn, though. I mean, I uh, to me, every day is the first day of kindergarten, so there's still <laughs> so much true? further to go. School is you know, always But I really appreciate there. that. I really well, appreciate you're quite that. Well. And I want to bring you back after the first of the year because I want to know where you are and what all you have done since okay. the show. Um, ladies and gentlemen, we will be closing the show shortly. This is Off the Chain. I am Yvonne Mason, your host. And my last few pieces of advice is be kind to yourself, love yourself, live, and be happy because at the end of the day and at the end of our lives, 
the only thing that we have is what we gave to each other and to our So I will leave you with that thought. I will see you Saturday night at 8 o'clock Eastern with my guest, Chad Lutz. This is Off the Chain. I'm your host, Yvonne Mason. Until then, good night. Okay, thank you so much, my friend. That was so much fun. That was so fun. <laughs> well, I uh, I appreciate so, so much you agreeing to come out. And you thought you had nothing to, to offer. I know. Well, that's great. Well, you know, guidelines help, so there you go. Well, you your influences are amazing. Well, yeah, because I'm not just influenced by visual artists. There's, you know, actors, special effects people, musicians. I mean, everything that I like, if I, if I see or hear or experience something I like, I always think, because it, it's not good enough to be a passive consumer, I think somehow I'm going to use this. <laughs> and see, so you can that's teach how art. You really could. Yeah. You, you can get students and teach art. But start putting, yeah, I mean, start putting yourself out there as an illustrator for as a book cover designer, and let's see if we can't get you some work. Let's get your projects built up. Yeah, we'll see what happens. Well, we can only go for it. That's right. We don't know till we try. As as we say, yeah. we try, we succeed. Exactly. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to end this this little couple of minutes that we've talked will be on the tail end of the, the archived episode and all the podcasts okay. because the show itself is gone, but they let us stay on for a little while, and it will be in the archives. So people will know that we're going to try to get you out there. So start right. branding yourself as, as a book cover designer as well. All, all covers, you know, you're open to anything. Right, right. That I will. And I will... I will get this into archives. I'll start putting up the podcast, and I'll tag you in them, and then I'll get with you and set you up for a show after the first of the year. Oh, great. Sounds great. Fantastic. Thank you again, my friend. Oh, thank you so much, and it was nice to finally meet you. <laughs> it was, wasn't it? <laughs> it was good to meet you, too. <laughs> and we'll talk later. Sounds good. All right. Bye-bye. Have a good night. You, too. Bye-bye. Record better audio anywhere with Motive Digital Microphones from Shure. Easy-to-use options like the MV88 plug directly into your phone or computer and include a free app. Create studio-quality sound for podcasts, music, and videos. Visit Shure.com to learn more. Fall fashion's in full swing, and it's time to save big at Old Navy. Starting tomorrow, get up to 50% off store-wide on your favorite dresses, pants, and tops. Plus, all jeans are on sale from $15 tomorrow at Old Navy. Valid 923 to 102. select styles only.